Hello, Soundies. Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Great to have you here today. It's the 31st of March, 2024. And we don't have an agenda to cut to today for um, a variety of reasons. <laughs> but what we're going to do today is we're going to play a little bit. And one question that I've had come up a number of times is, do con are control surfaces really worth it? Do they really speed up your workflow? And we're going to take a look at one specific control surface that you can use with a digital audio workstation, specifically with DaVinci Resolve Fairlight. And that is, let's go ahead and cut to the overhead camera here. Uh, that is the Fairlight desktop console. And um, I guess the short answer is it depends. And for many of us, no, it's probably not worth it. This is over, it's about a $3,200 control surface, which is pretty expensive. It is really well built and we'll take a closer look in just a minute here, but uh, it's probably not worth it for a lot of us. And let me explain where it would be worth it and we'll play around a little bit too. So let me just start with giving you a tour here. Um, this is actually made so that you can actually cut a hole in your desk and slot this in. It has a rim around the edge here. This bit here is the silvery bit, silver gray is sort of a, is a metal of some sort. This part here has a plastic top. Um, but I believe it's, anyway, yeah, I think this part down here is plastic and then this up here is metal. So the idea is you, you it comes with a template, you cut a hole in your desk and you put it in, or you can just use it on top of your desk. It does have some feet on the back to kind of tip it up a little bit as well, if you choose to do that. So you can use it either way. Um, and like, did I say this already? We're going to, we're going to show this to you so you don't have to spend the money and figure it out yourself <laughs> if, if you, if, whether or not it's useful for you. I think the short version is if you work often on paid work where you have to mix a lot of channels, that's where something like this becomes really, really useful. Um, on the other hand, if you're record, you know, if you're mixing little interviews or talking head videos, then a lot of this you can do without something fancy like this and, and just as just as easily. Um, there are, I believe there are some other control surfaces you can connect to DaVinci Resolve, but none of them that I have work with Resolve yet, at least. Um, so in any case, that's kind of a background on this. All right, you can see, obviously there are a whole series of faders, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 faders. And in fact, if I, I'm gonna go ahead and do something here. I'm gonna go ahead and save my project in DaVinci Resolve. You'll see this in just a minute. Don't, don't fret. I'm gonna quit DaVinci Resolve and you can see the faders are motorized. They reset themselves. Um, and then as soon as I open DaVinci Resolve again, uh, which is one of worlds, there it goes. So it kind of resets itself, all of them to zero dB. And then when I open the project, it resets it to the project settings. So um, that's a nice thing. You, um, obviously you, it has a power input. The power supply is integrated. So you don't have a separate power brick, which is nice. You have a few different outputs here. You have an RJ45 jack to connect this to your ethernet network and you can control, you know, if your computer and this are on the same ethernet network, then you can control um, with this, your DaVinci Resolve instance on your computer, or you can use USB. There's a USB-C port here as well, which is what we're using today. In addition to that, there's an HDMI port on this. And the reason for that is it allows you to connect a monitor. You can't really see it right here. And uh, in a future episode, perhaps we'll be able to solve that problem. For whatever reason, the A10 Mini did not like the feed coming from that uh, because it was a 60p feed and it just couldn't do the cross conversion for whatever reason, I don't know why. Um, but in any case, I've got a monitor here and the, the uh, monitor here. Uh, the nice thing about that is that when I, for example, if I wanna bring up, if I select this channel here, and I'm getting ahead of myself, before we go there, um, we have scribble strips and little a little screen for each individual channel here, which is really nice. And it shows you a variety of different information. Up at the top, it gives you the name, tells you the format of the channel, whether it's stereo or mono or something else. It uh, shows the pan, and it also shows where it's routed to. Um, and actually, whoa, see here, this is our pan control uh, by default. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that back at center. There we go. 
All right. Um, then we have a row of buttons here that say SEL. That's the select button. So you can select multiple channels at the same time or just one. And what that allows you to do is then when you, for example, press the compressor here, you'll notice that the screen suddenly changed. Now I have the controls for, let's see, no, actually I don't. So I, we're, we're actually changing the, oh, I didn't select the channel. So there we go. So we're going to select this channel here. And that's our compressor for this channel. So what happens on the screen here that you can't see right now, and again, um, we'll, we'll solve that problem. We need an extra cross converter to make that happen to show that to you. But up on my screen here, I have all of the controls for the Dynamics processor for this particular channel, which is really nice. So the nice thing about having this extra screen here is it doesn't take up all the real estate on your computer's instance of DaVinci Resolve. So that makes things pretty handy. Uh, below that, we have solo buttons for each channel. So if you want to just quickly listen to one channel, so you can hear what's happening on that particular channel and just kind of put the rest of the mix on mute. You can do that. Um, of course, you can also mute the entire mix over here or diminish the mix. Diminish is basically pulling everything down by, I think, 20 dB. I don't remember exactly the number, but it essentially kind of puts it in quiet mode for a little bit. Uh, mute, on the other hand, of course, mutes the entire mix over here. And of course, we have mute buttons for each individual channel, so you can mute those. You can move between banks of controls. I only have one bank here because I don't. I only have what one, two, three, four, five, six, six active channels plus a single bus. So we're not using all the faders here, but you could move between the banks, and, um, and then you have user assignable buttons over here. Of course, the chat, the faders, the hundred millimeter faders, motorized for each channel, which is nice. Over here, you have your transport controls. Um, we have obviously play, stop, record, uh, forward and back. We also have shuttle and scroll, and I'll show you once we get DaVinci Resolve up on the screen here how that works, how those two different things work. You have your automation buttons up here, so you can turn your automation on and off very quickly. You can stop, you can change the mode, um, and you have a, a few other things here as well. Oh, here's where you switch banks, um, actually. So here's where you choose the different banks over here. Um, here's our monitoring. So again, that's where the mute and the diminish are. You can choose your source, switch speakers, um, so on and so forth. So that's what we have going on over there. So pretty straightforward. It is, again, these buttons are nice. They're, Danny mentioned, oh, they're kind of noisy. <laughs> they are very solid buttons. They're going to last. Um, so the three thousand two hundred dollar price point. I don't think we pay, I don't think we paid that much for it. I think the price has gone up recently. We bought it um, a little over a year ago. Maybe I'm mistaken on that, but in any case, it's a pretty pricey piece of equipment. But it, it makes sense if you're in a situation again where you're doing mixes with lots of channels in DaVinci Resolve on a regular basis, and you want something. You don't necessarily need a full Fairlight console, of course, but. Um, you would like a control surface that you can place on your desk or even embed within the surface of your desk. So that's the high level overview. Let's go ahead and switch to the super source here. And what this is going to show here is in the background now we have DaVinci Resolve and then I have just in the bottom left corner over here just a, a view down onto the control surface so you can see how that works. Let me go ahead and pull up our sound library just so that things fit a little better here so you can see everything. Now, what I have on the screen up here that's attached to the console is I have basically a more detailed version of this. So it has all of this, plus it has the meter section on my screen, which is really nice. So now I could actually, over here, I can turn these off and get a lot more real estate in DaVinci Resolve. And then instead, I have the metering and the mixer um, UI over here on my console screen, which is pretty nice as well. All right, we'll go ahead and leave these up for the moment. That's what you're looking at. So let's just play around a little bit. I've just, um, using the built-in sound library that comes with DaVinci Resolve, you can get it for free. Um, you just do a Google search for DaVinci Resolve Fairlight sound library and you'll it'll take you to the download link and you can just follow the instructions there to get it installed so i've got a bunch of different um effects recordings that i brought in here and so it's a little bit of a rainy day here in utah 
Um, for some of you, it's also a little rainy. Some of you have sunshine, but <laughs> we're kind of fit the mood here a little bit. So this is, this is, I've just created this little scene and we are essentially sitting at a cafe on a sidewalk in a city. Um, there's some rain, so we've got a little awning over us, thankfully, so we're staying dry, but this is what it all sounds like. And I'm going to start here. I'm going to un, so all right now, all of these are muted. So I've gone ahead and dropped in these different effects. Some of them are stereo. Um, the bird flapping their wings is actually mono. The car door is mono. The coffee shop ambiance is actually stereo. Of course, you can always tell because the 2.0, that refers to a stereo track. 1.0 is a mono track. Now we've got a car door at one point that opens and the person sits down in their car and then closes their car door. And then we've got our coffee shop ambiance too. So actually I'm going to take this and let's just move that up to the, to the front edge. Okay. So let's start with a coffee shop ambiance. That's this channel here. And this is what that sounds like. And I can move the fader, of course. Start with that about right there. Now let's get our let's get our rain going. Gonna unmute that. Hear the bird there. Couple of cars passing. Bring the coffee shop ambiance down a bit more. There's the light rain you can hear now. Sometimes to hear something, you rather than boost that channel, you cut other channels. So there's the car. Some birds in the background. Let's unmute our next one. We have our footsteps. You might want to pull that down a little. That should just be background. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop. So I can stop again using the transport controls here. Now, the nice thing is I can scroll back really well with this jog wheel here. So if I press the scroll button, you can see I can move uh, very quickly and easily my playhead, which is super nice. So for example, um, let's say that there is a downspout that just kind of spilled some water out here. Let's add that in. I'm gonna unmute. I'll go ahead and play. Way too prominent, so I'm going to go ahead and scroll back. Let's try that again. Okay, that's good. That fits better in the mix. We've got a bird that takes off. Let's unmute that. Here it comes. There are pigeon taking off there. <laughs> and again, if I if I bring it back up, let's let's scroll back. Let's listen to that again. Obviously way too loud, so I'm gonna scroll back. Let's use the fader here to get that sitting well within the mix. That again. Okay, there we go. We've got one more thing. We've got this car door. Let's go ahead and stop there. I'll unmute the car door, scroll on back. Somebody near the cafe getting into their car. Sounds like 
Actually, let me just push it up and then we'll fade it back to make it fit better in the mix. Okay, so that sounds like, we'll fade that back a little bit more. Actually, let's, let's boost it back up. Okay, so those are just some examples of the kind of things you can do. You can see the workflow. Um, and the nice thing too is that actually you can then if, you know, because you have fairly sophisticated routing here on Divin in DaVinci Resolve, you can route these to a bus and then you can actually use a single fader to manage all of that together if you wanted to, using it essentially like a, I guess like a DCA. Um, so creating those buses makes things a little bit easier. And that's just an example. Why don't we pause there for a minute? Let's go back to the main camera and just check in with the chat and see where people are at, what people are, <laughs> what people are thinking so far. That was our free uh, mix. Charles says, curious about how this might compare with Blackmagic Design Fairlight Desktop Audio Editor. Yes, that's a great question. In fact, I'm glad you brought that up. Let's switch over to the Mac. There are two different uh, products, desktop products. So we're looking here at the Fairlight Desktop Console, and there's also the Fairlight Desktop Audio Editor. And if we get a closer look at that, uh, let's see if we can make that big, bigger. This one is actually made more for editing audio versus mixing audio. So we were just mixing there. Um, the idea there is we were bringing all these different sound elements in and mixing them together to kind of create this soundscape. The editor is going to be more useful for cases where you are <clears throat> actually cutting and moving and trimming and things like that. So dialogue editors would probably find this more useful than the, the mixer or the, the desktop console. So that's kind of the main, at a very high level, that's the distinction. I have not used this before. Um, you can see it has its own, its own uh, dedicated screen here. And I think it's, I don't know if, again, haven't used it before. So my guess is that it's more of a, you're working on a single track at a time and you can switch between the tracks, I would assume. And you can apply these different effects really quickly. Um, cut, trim, move, all sorts of things like that. Now, there are some things we haven't shown yet on the desktop console. This makes automation really easy, and that's where having a control surface like this is better than just having a mouse or some sort of pointing device on your computer. I can actually move multiple faders at the same time, so I'm not tied down to a single mouse pointer. Um, and that's a distinction that where, again, it makes sense when you're working on these types of mixes where you have lots of channels and you want to be able to adjust things. You want to get the job done faster, you're getting paid, <laughs> and you want to be able to adjust things much more quickly. So in one pass, you could potentially adjust the levels on multiple faders, you could, especially when you're doing automation. Um, you can record automation on multiple channels at the same time. So automation is essentially recording the movements of your fader. That's one way to think of it. You can also apply automation to other things as well, but uh, kind of the main use case or the primary use case of automation is adjusting faders. So if there are cases, for example, where you want the footsteps just to, you know, slowly get louder and then fade into the distance, you can do that by using fader automation. Most common fader automation example is, of course, fading music in and out once dialogue starts or once dialogue stops. So you can do all of that on here as well. Christopher, does it have Visa or other mounting options on the bottom so you could put it on a short rolling C stand, for example? I don't think so. And I didn't specifically look for that. Let me just. Yeah, I know the picture doesn't show. Danny was saying you could just check here. I don't think it does, um, but I could be wrong. I don't think it's really made for that. It's really made for putting on a desk or in a desk. Let me just check really quick. Uh, 
Okay. Short answer, no, it does not. It does not, so it's not made for that purpose. Okay, Derek. Uh, I'm hoping Curtis Judd wants to sell his unit. <laughs> uh, maybe you could find used ones. They've been out for mm, two or three years now, so you might there may be some used ones on the market. Not sure. Uh, Charles, is this for live mixing or edit mixing or both? So DaVinci Resolve um, typically is used in a in a post type of setting. So I would say edit mixing, post mixing. That's kind of its main use case, I would say. There is DaVinci Resolve Live for live color grading. I don't know how that extends to the digital audio workstation. I've never, I don't know if it's capable of that or if anyone has ever used that in their, their workflow before. All right, Audio Buff says the only thing that's missing in that mix is somebody quoting Sherlock Holmes. Well, <laughs> maybe somebody sitting at the uh, the cafe could be quoting Sherlock Holmes as they prepare for the next uh, community play that they're going to be in. So we could add that. Does Resolve Studio come with this? It does with Speed Editor. Oh, good question. Uh, is it bundled? I don't think so. Um, 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 uh... Yeah, it doesn't say anything here. If somebody knows differently than that, but it doesn't look like, let me go to the Black Magic site. Black Magic Design. And let's go to Products and let's go to DaVinci Resolve. And let's go, we can switch over to the Mac here. Fairlight Desktop Console. Sorry, it's not It's not $3,200, it's $3,139. <laughs> um, and you can see there's obviously, there's the Desktop con Console. Here's your channel strip. So it will also show the effects and the buses. And um, when you switch to some of these, for example, if you want to change the compressor or the limiter, it will actually change the screen that way too. So you can actually see those down here. here here's an example of that. This is the EQ it looks like. So channel status display, blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah, I don't think it does. I think the answer is no. Good question. It comes with the cameras, but I um, and that's how I got my license, but I don't know if it... Yeah, I think you're going to have to buy one. $300 for the license. Matt, as a live sound engineer, I've always, I always look at editing as, wow, that should be so nice because you can do it and do it again and again. But then I did edits, and where did the time go? Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's when you're working professionally in post time is really important. So if you're doing a passion project, you have all the time in the world, and at least in theory. If you're working professionally, you got to move <laughs> and you got to move quickly. And that's where something like this starts to make sense. And frankly, you might see the price of $3,200 and, and say, or $3,139 and say, wow, that's a lot of money for a ancillary tool. But if it's core to the work that you're doing, then you charge your, your customers accordingly. If you can get the mix, mix done in, you know, four hours because you have a tool like this versus eight, 12 hours for someone that doesn't, or if you didn't, then it may be worth it. And so you can charge your prices accordingly to, to clearly cover the cost of something like this. Lucas, I am much more comfortable with keyframes rather than automation, especially with corporate stuff where we get a lot of change requests. I would love to have one for EQ controls. That's fair. That's fair. So the distinction there, um, for those that are not familiar with automation, it puts a million keyframes. It's essentially, it is using keyframes, but as you change the fader, it's drawing you know, hundreds to thousands of keyframes, um, and it can make them very, very smooth, but it also is a lot, it's quite a bit of work to edit them. And I think what we're hearing there is that it's easier just to use individual keyframes where you just maybe put down four keyframes to quickly 
drop something out or, or boost something up very quickly. So yeah, there you can do both. You can do both. But yeah, it's nice for EQ. Uh, OBL Studio says, I am done with editing and visual effects. Would you recommend using Fairlight for a complete dialogue and sound editing for a feature film? Yes, I think it'd be a fine choice. Christopher, does it only tweak resolve, Resolve's own compressor EQ, etc., or can you also edit third-party VST settings from the surface? Great question. Let's check. I don't think it's set up to do that, to be honest. There would be some pretty deep integration that would be required there, Christopher. So let's bring our effects up. Let's drop in the distortion or... Well, let's let's put the dialogue processor. No, I don't have any dialogue. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Let's put a limiter. We don't have any limit. <laughs> we don't have anything that's that close. Um, what can I do? Let's put a reverb on the coffee shop. We'll drop that on the here. So that comes up here. Now, the question is, if when I select coffee shop on here, I'm not seeing it show up. That's interesting. Again, I am just getting started with this. So um, let's go to the to the, um, the super source so people can see what's happening on the console as well. Interestingly, I don't know if I close this and I come to the inspector audio, it doesn't look like Let's select coffee shop. Or actually, let's select the clip. Uh, it didn't look like it dropped it on there. There it is. Okay. Now the reverb shows up there. But I'm not seeing it here. Let's just uh, make some changes here. It looks like, okay, so to answer your question, Christopher, my guess is that it's only going to affect the specific, these essentially, these built-in um, effects and not, oh, here we go, in, we have our effects. Let's make sure those are all enabled. Yeah, not seeing it. Experimenting with it here still, but I'm pretty sure no. Third party, you're not gonna you're not gonna get those. If I press the compressor, for example, on the console here, you can see, of course, that brings up the dynamics processor there. Same if with limiter. If I press the limiter, it brings that up. If I press the EQ, it brings the equalizer up. So it's just using it looks like it just supports that for the built-in effects. The built-in channel effects is what it looks like specifically. Can you get Fairlight to work subframe? I have not figured that out. Um, subframe. I think I understand. I think I understand what you're saying, but it's a sample based. It's working down at the sample level. I guess I'm not a hundred percent sure what you mean by working at subframe. In other words, you mean the playhead will only go one frame at a time? It actually goes more than one frame at a time. So I guess I just need clarification on the question there, please. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at uh, automation here, shall we? Let's say, for example, uh, let's go out of here. Let's get our sound library up. Let's maybe say that we want, I'm going to do a shift Z to zoom back out. We have our bird wings here. Maybe I want to automate those a little bit. So I'm going to kind of just zoom in a bit here. And over on the console here, of course, I have automation is turned on, but let's go ahead and turn it on here for this particular track. So I'm going to set it to, I want to change the fader level. Um, we're going to go ahead and show that. I want to turn on the, let's see, it's going to go to right, and I want to latch on to the last one. This is not a full lesson on how to do automation, but 
Um, I don't want to hold on stop. And we're going to control the fader. You can also, of course, um, you know, automate panning, automate e equalization, compression, gate, limiter, other plugins. Okay, so now I have that automated. So we're on the bird channel. That's this one right here. So as we play this back, I can actually adjust that. So again, we are right here. I think I want to start around, uh, maybe around here. Let's go. Okay, so you can see how we wrote that automation. That was the fader. And I'm going to zoom back out. Whoops, not too far. So we kind of gave it a little bit more character here by automating it. This is what it sounds like now. And watch the fader. You'll see this move, this one right here, will move as we play back. Oh, it didn't move. Interesting. So, what is it doing? So it reset it. So I didn't do something right. Let's let's record it again. Okay, it's enabled. See there, this channel here, here we go. Okay, so there is our automation. Now we just want it to read. I touched it. <laughs> That's what latch does. I want to touch, turn that, turn that off. So let's do this again. Let's re-enable it. We'll start right here. And here we go. Okay. So touch is turned off. Now when we play it back, should be able to see this fader move right here. Okay, so that's kind of the magic of automation with motorized faders. <laughs> um, so that's kind of a cool thing that you can do with this. And again, you can do that with multiple channels or multiple tracks at the same time, which is pretty nice as well. All right. Let's take up another pause there. Let's see what people have to say in the chat here. Thanks for learning with me on this one. Charles, I could see the benefit for mixing multiple elements of the mix with this tool would be valuable. Yeah, again, it, um, obviously I haven't been mixing a lot of uh, films lately, so <laughs> I haven't put this to use until now. We've had it for a little over a year. Just now getting an opportunity to take a look at it. So it was Light and Sound Media that bought it. Uh, Fairlight has subframe, nudge, etc. Yes, indeed. So maybe perhaps that was, is what you're referring to. I guess having 12 faders is a benefit compared to a generic uh, MIDI controllers. I think the protocol for other controllers only support eight faders per page. Yeah, not positive. This one's a, a proprietary. So it, 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 the setup is literally plug it in and it, and it uh, picked it right up. You didn't have to do anything fancy for Resolve to see it and recognize it and use it. If you do need to, um, let's go ahead and switch back to the Mac here. It's a matter of just coming into the Preferences under Control Panels, and you can see here we have the Fairlight Desktop con Console. Um, didn't have to change anything else, just like that. Clicked Save, and it was working out of the box. So that's the beauty of this one.
Okay. Anything else in the chat? Any other questions in the chat? If you do, at Curtis Judd Audio, and we will get those up on the screen here. Let's do some more experimentation here then while we have some time. What other elements could we add to our mix here, you might ask? Since we are... Let's see here. Show fader level. Okay, so this is what's viewed here. So we're showing the fader automation in this track right now. If we go back to none, I believe it'll still play the fade the um it'll still play the automation, it just won't show it. So let's see if this fader still moves right here when I play it back. Still does so you can switch back and forth between those views here the um, interesting thing the faders are actually quiet they're fairly quiet the buttons are the noisy bit on this console so <laughs> let's see what else we've got here what else could we get um maybe is there a bicycle uh, we have some bicycle movements let's just hear those we'll just see if we can add a bicycle Like a, an older kind of bicycle, a squeaky. I need a little work, but that's a lovely addition. Let's go ahead and add that to our mix. Why not? We can. Let's put it down here, and you can see here. Watch as I move things around. You can see it's selecting a new track for this here. We'll put it right below the coffee shop, <clears throat> and we'll call this our bicycle. Oh, for people that came late, we're looking at the Blackmagic Design Fairlight desktop console. And so maybe uh, maybe the bicycle goes by right before the bird. That would make sense, wouldn't it? Maybe the bicyclist kind of got the bird. Uh, the bird didn't feel safe, so the bird needed to get out of the way. <laughs> so let's see where this puts us. Okay, so up here on the console, bicycles here now. Uh, we could automate some panning. We can do that as well. That'll be fun because this bicycle is a mono track, so it's just going to play right in the center. Um, but let's just see as a start where it sits. Oh, wait. We definitely have the reverb on there, and we need to get that off. So we're going to go into the inspector, and we're going to the effects, and we are definitely... Uh, deleting that so we do not want the reverb okay starting over let's close the inspector here we go maybe maybe a little more overlap between the bicycle and the birds maybe as the bicycle's coming the bird takes off Bicycle's really quiet, so we're going to go ahead and boost that. Just grab the clip gain. There we go again. Okay, let's see about maybe... Let's look at the pan. Left, right pan. Okay, and let's automate that. So here we are. Bicycle is this track here. This multi-controller will be our pan control. So I'm going to switch it to pan. And I'm going to start... 100% left, and we're going to sweep it to the right as we go. Let's see what we get here. Oh, 
Okay. Let's play it back and see what happens. Let's solo it so we can hear it better. I'm hearing that all on the right channel. Is that just me? Yeah. <laughs> Danny doesn't have both ears on. Okay. Okay, here we go. Get pan. Pretty extreme pan. Here we go. Now we're going to play it back. Okay, let's put that in the mix. Get ourselves back. Zoom out. Here we go. Play. There's another element there for us. All right, what else can we add? Well, let's take a pause. Anything in the chat? Any questions while we're here? Get a little sip of water. All right, we do have a follow-up question from a few weeks ago from Matt. Cheap-ish light question. I went with the Amran 60X lights. You asked me to report back, okay? Oh, it's on. Okay. No, no, I know. Did you have good experience? Bad experience? Haven't, haven't, haven't tested yet. I'm just curious how those have worked out for you. Hopefully good. You need to match that to the cars as well. The panning. Yeah. Let's see. What are the cars doing? Let's, let's listen to the cars. Let's go back to the super source. Yep. Okay, so let's come up to our cars, which are actually part of the rain track here. We're gonna select that first of all, solo that, and let's see what we have. What was that? Yeah, there's a little bit of a, there's a little bit of a, at least a Doppler effect, if not panning. I think there may be some panning in there already. Let's play. I'm going to unsolo that. Let's keep going. I feel like I'm at a I'm at a cafe. I'd like to order something, please. Um, maybe some, maybe an omelet would be nice this morning. <laughs> All right, back out to the chat. Let's see what we've got going in the chat. Uh, I like those lights. Good for an interview. Yeah, same, same. Especially if you've had to buy... A, I can't remember how many you said, Matt. I think it was uh, it was a lot, though. As I recall, you had to buy a whole bunch of them. So hopefully that works out nicely. Curious what you also ended up with for stands to get them uh, mounted. I tried five separate lights, and we went with the Amran. The build quality was noticeably better. Yeah. Yep. That's a, Amran does a pretty decent job. A lot of plastic, but they usually do a pretty nice job with the plastic that they do use. 
All uh, right. Question, man. Apart from being part of the ecosystem, it would be nice to highlight what makes this product stand apart from other similarly priced products. This is a brand new world for me. I would love to know the answer to that question too. <laughs> so I don't know the answer to it. Um, I think part of it is that it's made to sit within your desk. So that's one thing. Almost every other one from other manufacturers that I've seen is made to sit on top of a desk. This one can sit on top of a desk, but is also made to embed within your desk. As we covered earlier, there's a kind of a lip if you go to the overhead camera, Danny. There's a lip around the edge here. It comes with a little template. Um, comes with a template so that you can uh, cut the hole in your desk. And then there's a, a lip right here that makes it so it fits flat into the desk. And uh, that's one thing for sure. Uh, no setup, um, right out of the box it works, that's another thing. So those are at least the, the initial things that I can say. Um, that You know, the choice of buttons, the fact that you have dedicated buttons for the built-in effects, the equalizer, the uh, expander, the compressor, the limiter, pan controls, um, the automation has automation buttons. So other MIDI controllers, of course, you could program things to do that, but these these buttons are actually labeled that out of the factory. The jog wheel is really nice, um, which you can use as a shuttle or as a scroll wheel. So both some nice things there. Okay, and then I think there was a question about panning. We, we did cover that, yeah, Steve. We did do the panning automation with the um, bicycle. So that's how you do the panning automation. Also some uh, monitoring controls, kind of proprietary stuff. I think that's the big dif difference is proprietary. 12 channels too is a... a is a is a little bit more than you find on most MIDI controllers out there. So it's a nice one as well. All right. Well, a um, couple of things. We have a review, or not a review, but we have a little tutorial on how to split multi-channel files, specifically poly wave files, in DaVinci Resolve. That is a, one of the most common questions I've received. And especially, there used to be, a, uh, and there still is, an app called Wave Agent that Sound Devices makes. And it's a great app. The only problem is they haven't updated it in a very long time. And I know on Mac, there are special installation instructions you have to follow now, kind of a little bit, um, it feels a little cloak and dagger. <laughs> they just haven't updated it. And it doesn't uh, work with 32-bit float files. So I don't, my sense is they don't really have any intention of updating that anymore. Um, so to answer that question, there are other apps you can do it. it. Pretty much any digital audio workstation should be able to do that. I found that DaVinci Resolve is one of the easier ones. You literally drop a PolyWave file in, and what I'm finding in this latest version, 18.6.6, it assumes you want them on separate tracks. And that's that's fantastic. That makes it very, very easy. Other DAWs, a lot of times if you grab a PolyWave file and drop it into a track, it will drop it into a track as a 5.1 or 7.1 or whatever. Um, it makes a different assumption. Again, you can work around that in any digital audio workstation, but uh, Fairlight makes it very easy. So it's pretty nice. We have another uh, video coming up here very soon. A uh, way to fix pasty skin tones uh, using a bounce uh, fabric talk about that and you'll see that come up in the next week or so and then we'll be doing more DaVinci Resolve I'm kind of diving in a little bit more so uh, some things have changed at work I'm, I'm not sure yet I might be able to do a lot of my work in Resolve we'll see if that's possible um, but that's that may be coming as well today's signal chain um, just for those that are curious we're using a Shure SM57 that is routed over into the Mackie DLZ creator that's going line out into the Canon C200 camera, which is what you're seeing right here. And then that combines the sound from the mixer, the Mackie, uh, with the video and sends it to the A10 Mini. So that's our signal chain for today. I was, uh, I had attempted to set up the, this monitor that connects to the console. I attempted to use a, a different monitor. I was using um, the Atomos Sumo, the 19 inch production monitor because it has an HDMI input and output, this monitor that I'm actually using only has an HDMI input, not an output, so I couldn't feed it into the ATEM so you could see it as well. When I hooked up the Atomos, this was interesting. It was uh, the signal coming out of the console evidently is a 1080p 
60, so 60 frames per second. And this whole stream is at 29.97. So the ATEM basically said, I, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> they couldn't take that signal. Even though it has cross converters built in, it wasn't, it wasn't managing it. So um, that's why I don't have it set up to show you today. I could also get some cross converters. This, this monitor I do have here has SDI inputs and outputs. So if I got a cross converter that I could convert the, the 60p signal down to 29.97 and feed that into the ATEM, we could do that. So for a future episode, we'll do that. That's where we're at today. We have comments. Danny is scouring the chat right now. Um, okay, back to the lighting. We have recommended the Manfrotto Aluminum Mini Compact Air Cushion Stand, black seven foot, but we're not supplying them because of shipping costs. Funny thing, one is going to Timbuktu in Mali. Wow. <laughs> Literally to Timbuktu, okay. <laughs> yes, SM57 for the win. It's a, it's a classic. Thank you, Curtis, for doing all this DaVinci content. You're absolutely welcome. Can you do a video about how to properly light darker skin tones? Ooh, that's a good one. That's a very good one. Yes, I think we need to do that. Great suggestion. Better make a note of that while I'm thinking about it. going to put in episode ideas. We're going to get a new note and we're going to say lighting darker skin tones. That's actually um, a really interesting topic. And the reason I say that is I've noticed, you'll notice different films and even, uh, you know, online videos. So if you look, for example, Marquez Brownlee, um, the way he lights, sometimes it varies. Um, and there are, there are different ways you can do it. Of course, you can do that with any with any skin tone, of course, but it's you get very different effects depending on how you expose and then how you finish as well. So, uh, Decimator 12G Cross is an awesome device. It is. I've got I've got some of those. We're actually using some right now. They're down on the floor over there <laughs> doing their cross conversion. So yeah, the only problem with that, I don't know if it's still the case. They were $500 each when I bought them. They're a fantastic um, cross converter, but they're a little on the pricey side. And they have a very awesome spider on them, on spider the desk. Logo. Spider logo, yeah, not a spider, spider, actual spider. But All right, any other questions in the chat? If not, we're going to wrap this on up early, friends. Uh, I, too, appreciate the DaVinci content. Me, too. I'm, I'm uh, finding myself more and more frustrated with Final Cut for a variety of reasons sound being the primary <laughs> and um i don't know what apple's doing over there with final cut i haven't seen a lot of things that i need in final cut recently uh, actually they did finally actually make this the uh the timeline scroll in 2020 i think they introduced that in 2023 it was like wow <laughs> and even when they introduced it it was kind of choppy it's smoother now but it's like wow it took them a long time to get to that one because Let's see, it, Final Cut Pro, what was originally known as Final Cut Pro 10, came out in 2011. So it is, what, 13 years old? Took them like 12 years to put scrolling timelines in. It's like, wow. <laughs> Just some funny, funny decisions. And the audio, I've never really wrapped my head around how they're expecting you to do audio in Final Cut. It's just, the trackless model is great for editing, but... It's a little bit nutty for audio. 12G Cross is still $500 US and hard to get. They sell out in days anytime B&H gets more stock. Okay, I got lucky. I got mine early in the pandemic, I think, before everyone else started buying all of their live streaming gear. <laughs> so definitely a useful tool. All right, friends, we're going to wrap for today. Thank you so much for coming by. Get out there, make some great sound, and we will talk to you again next week. Talk care.